that's why you want people to ask. <laughs> Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you can please find a seat really quickly. We want to make a start as soon as possible, keep things running nice and smooth uh, this morning. The video guy, are we ready? Yep, take that as a yes. Uh, everyone, uh, welcome to the second session here at PyCon 2014. Uh, our next presenter is a French developer, currently the technical co-founder of Neon Mob, a growing online collection platform running on Django with several tens of thousands of active users. Uh, today he's going to be presenting, us, uh, presenting to us about caching techniques and best practices. Please welcome Guillaume Ador. Thank you. Uh, Cash Me If You Can is the title of my talk. Uh, I just had to do that pun, sorry. <laughs> Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, I'm delighted to be in Montreal with my Francophone cousins. Uh, I'd like to thank the PyCon organizers and volunteers. And today we're going to talk about uh, Memcached. Memcached, if you're writing Python code that's running on any form of network or uh, groups of more than one computer, chances are you can use it to speed up your application dramatically. So we're going to talk about that. Uh, Memcached, we're going to start uh, Memcached itself, what it is, what it does. Um, then how does it work internally? It turns out when you know how it works internally, it makes your life much, much easier when you're debugging. And then we're going to talk about a few patterns and best practices in Python. Uh, we only have 30 minutes, so if you have any questions, please wait till the end. We'll have about five minutes for questions. Memcached, it's a key object store, very straightforward. You give it an object identified by a key, then later you can ask for a key, and it will give the associated object back to you. It has uh, the notion of expiration, so you only get the object back if it is not expired. If Memcached had a tagline, it would be O of one everything. Um, this means that every operation you do in Memcached is done in constant time, setting an object, retrieving an object, deleting an object. No matter how full the cache is or any factor, it's typically in constant time. Um, where does Memcached fit in your stack? Uh, in here, we're going to talk about web applications, but it's generalizable. Typically, you have a primary data store. Uh, most people like to use relational databases. In your, rela in your primary data store, you're going to put any data that you don't want to lose, any data that if you lose it, you're screwed. Um, user accounts, payments, whatever you, you have to keep. Um, a lot of people use uh, persistent stores to store data that can, uh, you can lose, you can afford to lose it, but it's very slow to regenerate. Uh, very slow here is going to depend on your application. If you're in a web application, very slow might mean a few seconds. If you're doing uh, DNA processing, very slow might mean days. Uh, here, you use a persistent store. Examples of that might include MongoDB, Redis, things like that. And then there's data that you can lose. Uh, and if you lose it, you can regenerate it fast. Once again, here, fast will depend on your application. Uh, in web applications, fast might mean dozens of milliseconds. In other cases, it might mean seconds. And that's where people like to use a RAM store. Uh, Memcached is a RAM store. Uh, typical Memcached API depends on the Python module you use in Python, but typically you'll get a cache object. Uh, for example, example, in Django, you do from Django.core.cache import cache, and then you get this cache object. You can set data, so here cache.set, uh, string identifying the object, and then the second string, uh, which is a value you want to cache. You can get the object back with cache.get, and then you can delete the object in memory with cache.delete. Uh, any pickleable object will typically work with your memcached module. Uh, when you set an object, you can give it an expiry. Um, so the expiry is get, typically given in seconds. I like to use constants, as shown below. It makes your code slightly easier to read and slightly more meaningful. Uh, and then you also get the underscore many counterparts of set, get, and delete. Uh, for set many, it takes a dictionary with keys as the keys and objects as the values. Uh, get many takes a diction uh, an array of keys, and delete many takes an array of keys. You typically want to use those because when you're dealing with memcached, the, um, the slowest part of the operation is typically network latency. Uh, maybe it's 10 milliseconds, 20 milliseconds, but that's going to be the bulk of your latency. And if you are wanting to fetch 100 keys, if you do a get many, you only have, let's say, a 20 second delay. If you did the 100 keys iteratively, you would get 20 milliseconds times 100, which can get very slow, very fast. So typically, you want to use those as much as realistically possible in your application. And then you also get uh, counter operations, where you can increase, decrease values. By default, they increase and decrease by one. You can pass any arbitrary number to increase it or decrease it by that number. 
And then we also have the add method, uh, which will only add a key in the, in the cache if it's not there already. Uh, so cache.set flavor pistachio will set the flavor key with the pistachio value. Then if you do cache.add flavor chocolate, the flavor of, um, key will not get overwritten because add only works if the key does not exist. Uh, and then cache.clear, fairly explicit, it flushes your entire cache. So memcached is completely in RAM. What that means is that when it dies, it dies. There's no way for you to recover your data, to do anything like that. Um, it does not support uh, natively any form of backups, although there are forks. I believe Facebook has a fork, which allows you to do dump to the disk. Uh, but memcached, the standard client, does not allow you to do anything like that. So when it's dead, it's dead. Do not store any data in memcached that you can't afford to lose. That's not the place for memcached. Every so often on Stack Overflow or mailing lists, you see people who want to store things like sessions in memcached. Um, typically a bad idea. If your memcached instance goes down, all your users are logged out. Uh, unless you have a really good reason to do that, you probably don't want to do it. Naming your keys, uh, one of the hard problems of computer science. <laughs> Very important. Use ASCII. Uh, memcached will not store anything that's not ASCII, so don't get fancy with Unicode or whatever. Um, don't make them crazy long, because memcached has to hash them. So as long as they're in the few dozens of characters, you're fine, but definitely don't have keys that are hundreds or thousands of characters. That will probably impact the, the performance of memcached just because of that hashing process. And obviously, you want them to be explicit enough to make your life easier. Um, obviously, do not use user input for cache names. Um, that's also a mistake you see sometimes. In, uh, on mailing lists or things like that, but as always, don't trust user input. Good naming, I like things like that that are very explicit, so if I'm caching JSON representations of my users on the website, json.users, and then the user ID. Bad example of naming, uh, MD5 of SQL query. At first, it seems really smart, uh, but then it turns out that it's impossible for you to know what it corresponds to, so fake good idea. Uh, a common question you see is how do I list all keys in memcached, or all keys matching a regex, or all keys starting with a certain prefix, or any sort of filtering on the keys? The answer is you don't. Um, it's a cache, not a database. You can't query it. If your code needs to do any form of filtering, querying uh, on the keys stored in memcached, you're using memcached wrong, or you're programming your application wrong. Typically, if you really need to do that, you want to use a document store or a database. Uh, in any way, memcached is the wrong tool for the job if you find yourself needing to do that. It's a common misconception. You find it often. How to list all memcached keys on Heroku. What is the simplest way to get a dump of memcached keys in a file? All variations you can imagine on the topic. You can't do it. Um, now you all know you can go educate the world <laughs> about not doing that. However, some malicious APIs, PHP not to name them, will expose a method named memcached get all keys. And then you read the description, um, and the description says, memcached does not guarantee to return all keys, so you cannot assume that all the keys will have been returned. <laughs> if you're designing an API and you have a method named get all keys, and then your documentation says not all keys will be returned, you're probably doing it wrong. Um, there is some truth to that. There is, uh, if you look at the memcached docs, there is uh, a call to memcached you can do that will list a partial order of the keys. Uh, it's a debug interface. It's a partial dump, so you are never guaranteed to have all of the keys, or any of them for that matter. It's no guarantee whatsoever. It's really slow. It's blocking. So only use it for debug purposes. Don't do it in prod. If you do it in prod, you're going to have a bad time. Memcached is distributed. You can run as many memcached nodes as you want. Uh, your memcached client is going to be in charge of uh, choosing which node to set uh, a key to and then uh, deciding which node to get it and delete it from. Um, the memcached nodes have no knowledge whatsoever, whatsoever of one another. It's all through your memcached uh, client. Uh, when setting a key, your memcached client decides which node to store it on. So Go to your client. Uh, most clients use consistent hashing. If your client does not use consistent hashing, uh, you probably want to use a different memcached client. What consistent hashing will, um, will guarantee is that there is an equal probability of the key being stored on any node, uh, which means that over a significant 
number of keys, it will all be equally distributed amongst the nodes. Uh, so here, if we send a key to box C, it will get stored on box C, but box B and box A have no knowledge whatsoever that box C stored a key, and they don't even know anything about that key. Uh, if a node goes down, the consistent hashing means that the gets and sets will get redirected to other nodes. So if we try to set the same key with only two nodes, this time it might go to box A. Uh, oops. And all keys the node had are lost. There's no way to retrieve them. The other nodes have no knowledge that the keys were once there. Uh, for all intents and purposes, it's as if they were never there, never set. A few memcached subtleties. Um, we're going to jump in the rabbit hole, and that's where we're going to try to understand how memcached works internally. Uh, a few aspects of that can be confusing to newcomers and then make your life difficult when you're writing applications. Expiration. So it's 8 a.m., and a request stores an object under the key foo with a two-hour expiration time. What happens at 10 a.m.? The answer is nothing. Um, it would be very expensive for memcached to sweep the cache every minute, every 10 second, every n interval, whatever, uh, and then remove the keys that need to be removed. Instead, what happens is if the client tries to access the foo key later, let's say at 1 p.m., um, then memcached is going to do the check at fetch time, and it's going to see that the key is expired, and it's going to remove it, and you're going to get none as a result. Um, a question. Sometimes fetching a key returns none, even though it's not supposed to have expired yet. Memcached has a fixed amount of memory. Uh, if you try to store data when the memory is full, data will get evicted. The way Memcached determines what to evict uh, is by using a LRU cache, least recently used. Uh, internally, each object is given a timestamp. That timestamp is updated every time the object is created, updated, or uh, fetched. And when data needs to be evicted, the object with the oldest timestamp will be picked. Uh, so if you try to fetch an object that gets evicted, you're going to get none. Sometimes fetching a key returns none, even though it's not supposed to have expired yet, and memcached still has free memory. Uh, that's where we need to go on an adventure. Uh, it's less intuitive to grasp, and for that, we're going to have to dive into how memcached allocates memory. When you start memcached, it tries to be smart about its memory, because the goal is to be fast. Um, so on startup, memcached is going to pre-allocate its memory and divide it up into pages. Each page um, has chunks in it, and the way those chunks sizes are determined is by calculating slab classes. Um, typically, the first slab class has chunk sizes of 80 bytes, and then there's a growth factor. So if the first class has uh, chunk sizes of 80 bytes, the second uh, class of chunk sizes will be 80 times 1.25, 100 bytes, and so on and so on, until your last page has one chunk of one megabyte. Uh, typically, that results in 40-ish uh, slab classes. For example, if I run it on my machine, uh, it turns out the first slab class has a chunk size of 96 bytes. That's what you can see on the first line. And then per slab, that means there's 10,922 chunks. Uh, class 2 is 120, it goes on and on, uh, and here you don't see the bottom of my terminal, but at the bottom there's slab class 42, uh, which is one chunk of one megabyte. Memcached allocates one page to one slab class on startup. So, for example, here, if we only had five classes and n number of pages, the first five pages would be one of each class, and then the rest are free pages. We'll see what those free pages do in just a moment. Uh, so again, here's what I see when I run memcached on my machine. Uh, if we ask memcached to store an object, it's always going to store it in a page with a chunk size that's as close as possible to that object size. So here, um, let's say we are trying to store an object of 130 bytes. The first class is going to fit in is class 3, where chunk sizes are 152 bytes. It's going to get stored in there. The last 22 bytes are lost. Um, Memcache doesn't try to be smart about it or anything. It stores the object in the smallest chunk possible, and any extra memory is lost. If all pages of a needed class are full, that's where the free pages come in. Memclass takes the Memcache D takes the first available page, and it gives it the needed class. Um, so earlier, with our 152 byte, uh, 130 bytes object, if all class 3 pages are taken, we take a free page, and we make it a class 3 page, and then we can store our object. If there are no more free pages, that's where the LRU kicks in and evicts data. 
the subtlety is that each slab class has its own LRU. Uh, not each page, each slab class. So if your data needs a class three um, page, and there are no more free pages, and all class three pages are full, but some class four pages have free chunks, it doesn't matter. The object needs to go in a class three chunk, um, and the data in a class three page will be evicted. So the answer to our earlier question, uh, when sometimes you try to fetch a key, it returns none, even though it's not supposed to have expired yet, and memcached still has free memories in some pages, the answer, the answer to that is that there are um, no more free pages, and all pages of the needed slab class are full. So that's where you kick out data. Uh, a few useful command line flags when you're on memcached, uh, you can change the verbosity of the output, which allows you to see the slab classes, uh, as shown in my command prompt earlier. Uh, you can use dash capital M so that it does not evict when out of memory, but errors out. In some use cases, that's useful. Uh, you can change the slab page size uh, anywhere from one kilobyte to 120 megabytes. It's useful to know what kind of data you're storing memcached D, because it turns out sometimes one megabyte is way too big um, for chunk sizes. If all of your objects are under, let's say, 100, 100 kilobytes, then you're wasting a lot of chunks in the pages that have chunks higher than 100 kilobytes. So it's useful to know what kind of data, what size of the data you're storing so that you can fine tune your memcached D instances to use the right kind of chunks and slabs. Uh, you can also change the growth factor, same thing, depending on your use, on your use case, you might want to make it more um, than 125, which is a default. Uh, there are a lot of more options. Um, man memcached D is your friend. The man page for memcached D is actually pretty good. It's rare, but it's pretty good. All right, now let's get our hands dirty uh, with some common memcached D patterns and practices in Python. So let's start with a Django-ish model. Um, for those who are not familiar with Django, it's a very simplistic model here, which has an author, which is a foreign key to some other object, uh, a title, a blurb, and then we have a toJSON method, which returns a JSON representation of that book. Here, it returns just the name of the author, uh, the title of the book, and its blurb. One thing we can start doing to make our life slightly simpler is to add a cache name property, which simply generates the name of the key in which to store that object. Uh, so here I'm following the convention json.books. the primary key of the book. Uh, it can be anything you want as long as it's consistent and explicit. And then we can start modifying our to JSON method to uh, try to get the book JSON from the cache uh, using the cache name property we just defined. If we get none, that means the object is not in the cache, then we can generate the JSON and set it in the cache and then return the book JSON no matter what. Uh, this means that the first hit on the book's JSON will hit the database, and then all subse subse subsequent hits until the object expires uh, will be fetched from mcached. That will greatly alleviate your database load. Um, one smart thing you can do is use model versioning, uh, which means that here I have a model version um, property on my model, and I am using it in the, in the key name. Uh, that's very useful because when you are modifying your models, say um, adding a field or things like that or removing a field, uh, you just bump up the model version and then all of your memcached hits will miss. Uh, some frameworks like Django support that out of the box, some others don't, so read your, read your docs to see if you need something like that or if it's already supported. Uh, we can modify the method to fetch straight from the cache if we know a book primary key. Um, here we are generating the key name, we just need the primary key for that, getting it from the cache. Um, if it's none, then we load the object from the database and save it into the cache, and then we return the book's JSON. Uh, we can modify that class, that, sorry, that uh, method to make it a class method, which takes instead a list of primary keys. Um, here I'm just, ha I have a string that will be the templates for my um, key name. I generate all of the keys uh, for the books I want, I do a get many to get all of the books. Um, remember, get many is there to be used. Uh, a lot of newcomers to memcached will forget about the many versions of get, set, and delete, and will iterate and do for uh, key name in key names, cache.get key name. Um, that will in introduce a lot of latency in your application waiting for memcached to do the round trip. So get many is your friend. Uh, the subtlety is that get many returns a dictionary which associates key names to objects. It's not guaranteed that all the keys you ask for will get returned. So that dictionary might have missing entries from what you want. Here, I'm converting the list of primary keys 
and the list of the keys I got back from MCACHD in two sets, so I can do uh, the intersection of those two and get the missing keys. Then I iterate uh, through the missing keys to uh, generate all the key names I need, generate the JSON I need. Uh, if the books I fetch from the database are more than zero, if len missing books, then I set them into the cache so that the next time around I hit the cache, uh, there will be in the cache. And then I return the books.update missing books. Books is what I got from MCACHD, and missing books is what I generate on my own. So I just merge the two dictionaries, and I have all my books. A common problem uh, is called thundering herd. Thundering herd occurs when you have a structure like that. Uh, so that's our JSON method from earlier, which fetches results from the cache. If results are none, it does some things to generate the results and then sets them in the cache and then returns the result. So this code looks fine and fairly uh, in innocent. But what happens if uh, you, your web server suddenly gets flooded with requests and those, uh, those lines of code get hit by dozens or hundreds of requests? If you're doing some very expensive stuff, like hitting a database, waiting on external services, crunching data, uh, you're going to have a lot of processes that are stuck in this part, and they're all doing the same computation because they all had a cache miss, and then they're all setting the data in the cache. Uh, this can result in your web servers or uh, application servers screeching to a halt as you have dozens of instances all trying to do the same thing, uh, which is fairly useless. So, a common solution to avoid that is to use a simple lock, where if results are none, the first thing is you set a lock in memcached, and then you only start computing the results if the lock is set to none. Um, what you do if the lock is not set to none depends on your use case. Um, maybe you display an error message. Maybe you wait uh, 20 milliseconds and you try again. Maybe you do something else. Uh, it will depend on what your application does. Um, so memcached by default has a one megabyte um, page size or maximum chunk size. You can tune it, but no matter what, uh, it's fixed. So if your object is larger than that limit, you're going to have uh, a little surprise when caching it, is that it's not going to fit, and memcached is going to not store it. And then you're, go you're going to consistently get none when fetching the object from your cache. So here we can imagine a list of book results where there are maybe thousands and thousands of books um, stored in an array. One way to solve this problem is by doing what's called a two-phase fetch. Uh, you are going to store just a simple list of IDs in memcached. So here, for example, uh, we're storing a list of book IDs under the name Library of San Francisco. Uh, you have a list of book IDs uh, that map to your book instances in your database, and then you can uh, use the methods we defined earlier to batch get those book IDs. Another way to address that problem is by using a paginated cache. Um, a paginated cache means you're going to break a big object in smaller chunks, uh, for example, chunks of 10 books. Um, you're going to store each chunk as a separate object in memcached, and then you're going to store the index of all the keys, that is, the list of all the keys. And then to fetch the data, all you have to do is fetch that index that contains the, all the key names, and then do a get many on all those key names and merge them all together. Uh, a sample class might look like something like that. Uh, we have a max length property on the paginated cache class and a set method. Um, the set method, quickly what it does, it looks at the length of all the data, it computes how many slices we're going to slice the data in, um, and then for each slice, it stores it into memcached, it adds the name of the key to an array, uh, and then we do a set many on the slices and a set on the, um, the list of indexes. Uh, you can merge those two sets. Here, they're not merged for slightly easier readability, but you can just do an update uh, on the slices with the name of the, of the index, so you can set everything at once and do one call to memcached instead of two. Um, then your get method is going to be very straightforward. You uh, get the index from the cache, and then you do a get many on what you got, and the delete method works in a similar manner. Uh, you delete everything uh, that you fetch from the cache. This solution has the advantage that if some chunks of the data get evicted for whatever reason, you will, as long as the index is still in memory, you can still fetch parts of the data. So if you're using this for things like search results, uh, it can be a nice partially res uh, eviction-resistant method uh, where if it doesn't matter in which orders the books are or whatever, 
um, you can use this this way. Uh, all right, thank you. We're five minutes from the end. Are there any questions? Thank you. So if you have a question, please line up at the microphone just in the middle there so that we can get them picked up by the recording. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Hi, thanks for the talk. I really appreciated it. Uh, so a few months back, I was working with uh, some caching. And one uh, technical detail, which if it's incorrect, please let me know. But uh, get many and set many don't actually correspond to memcache operations one to one. They actually use the get and set. So it's kind of important to know with what I'm going to talk about. With uh, get many, you mentioned that you're not guaranteed to get the keys back that you request because they might not actually be there. What I discovered, though, was that with set many, there is cases where if you're trying to set hundreds of thousands of keys, that will actually fail. And only a partial set of the keys that you tried to set would actually be completed. Have you ever experienced this issue? So um, I'm assuming that in this, so sorry, the, should I repeat the question? The question was, oh, no, no, wait, OK. okay. Um, so in this case, uh, I'm guessing that it's quite probable that your server was, uh, your memcached node was already partially full. And so the set many uh, set in memory as much as it could, and then when it was full, um, it, it did not evict any data, and, or either it did not evict any data and you only got the first ones that were set, or it did evict the data and you only got the last ones with, that were set. Was to, that the case? To, uh, to, to counter that possibility, I made sure that the memcached was actually clear, there was no other data in there, mm -hmm. and that there was sufficient room to actually handle all the data, and what was being stored were just integers, so it wasn't large data at all. And that also by switching to using a loop strategy, where you know, unfortunately having to loop through all of the keys and set them one by one, and then actually manually checking them after with a get many verified that they were being set, but with using set many it would fail. And looking at the memcache logs, it looked like that the the uh, memcache server was actually just completely disconnecting for hmm. the failure. So that's interesting. I've never encountered that. Um, if if your experiments show that your memcached server had enough memory to handle it and it did not perform as expected, uh, it could be that there's a bug in memcached. Uh, so if you have working code that can reproduce this problem consistently, I would encourage you to send it to uh, developers. It could very well be a problem in the uh, Python wrapper. It so. could, yeah, it could be that. So you could either try to write your test code for uh, multiple Python wrappers or other language wrappers, or uh, memcached itself speaks uh, a very simple TCP protocol. So you could try to just uh, send the messages in raw over that TCP protocol. You, you can um, learn it in like 30 minutes. It's really straightforward. And you could try to reproduce that. But yeah, I've never encountered that. And I would be very curious to, to observe it. Right. Keep an eye out for yeah. it. Feel free Thanks. to send me an email with the code if you, if you have code that reproduces that. Will do. Thank you. We'll make this the last question. Uh, sorry. Um, early on in the talk, you talked about when C goes away and it rehashes to A and B. What happens when C goes, comes back and then it goes away again? And you have things that are all over the place. Uh, so what happens if C goes away and then comes back again? So the consistent hashing will ensure that when a node is added, uh, any keys that are going to go to that node, um, sorry, any keys that whose hash match that node are going to go to that node. Then when you remove it, it's the same thing is going to happen. Well, wouldn't it happen where C goes away, you write something, it goes to B instead of C. C comes back. It's cleared. Mm -hmm. you, write it to, you write a new value to, the, to something. C goes away. You go read it again. I it's see. Gonna get the, is there any fix for that? Uh, interesting. I've never tried that. That's a really good case to try. I'm we hit try it last week. Yeah. Very good uh, edge case. Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, we're all out of time. Uh, if you have questions for Guillaume, uh, you can meet, him up, meet up with him after the talk finishes, probably just outside or something like that. Yep. And we'll be happy to take those. Um, everybody, please thank Guillaume. Thank you. So we've got 10 minutes break. We'll be back at 10 past 12 with Alex Gaynor.